Good morning. Please remain standing in body or in spirit for today's scripture lesson, a reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one of them had heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, prosif and your young men see all visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prosify. And I will show portents of the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And please be seated, and thank you so much, John, for that wonderful reading of the Scripture lesson this morning. And good morning, Christ Church. Morning. What a joy it is to be with you this morning, whether you are here in person or joining us online. It's good for us to be together today. As we continue in worship today, let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we, we thank you again. We thank you that in the power of your Spirit, you have gathered us in, in your name. We thank you for all that you have already had for us today, God, through song and silence, through prayer and petition, through just coming into your very presence. Lord, you meet us in this place, and you bless us, and you lead us, and you speak to us. So continue to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for all that you might have for us today. We pray this in your wonderful name and all God's people said. Amen. There are very few things in life, there are very few things in this world that brings more joy than holding a young child, than holding a newborn. Isn't it just kind of great to hold a newborn? Isn't that a, isn't that a great feeling to get to do that? I mean, it's just a wonderful feeling. I, I have, uh, can I tell, do you all know that I have grandchildren? Are you aware of that? Um, I would like to talk to you about my grandchildren uh, all the time, actually, but just a little bit, because something I noticed very quickly when uh, I began having grandchildren, Kathy and I have two, Everett and Eleanor, and what I quickly recognized about our grandchildren is that they are unlike all the others, that they're, they're, they're perfect in every way, it seems like, and I, I don't know how it worked out that way, but I, I do, in all seriousness, distinctly remember the first time I held them shortly after their birth. And it was, a, it was a moment each time, but in particular when I held Eleanor, and those online are, are, are getting to see a picture of that moment. I, I didn't know I was being photographed, but they put Eleanor in my arms. 
and something happened to me. <laughs> it was like a charge of electricity. I was just overcome with, with love and joy. And as I looked into that precious little face, I, 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 can't even, I don't even have words to describe the feeling that I had in that moment. There's something about holding a newborn. I recently heard a story about three expectant fathers who were in the waiting room waiting for news of, of their children being born, and the nurse finally comes out and, and finds the, the first dad, and, and she says, sir, congratulations, I have great news. Mom and the babies are doing fine. He said, babies? He said, yes. He said, congratulations, you are now the father of twins. And he was surprised. And he said, that's great news. Everybody's doing great. What a blessing this is. And, and he says, it's so oddly coincidental, too. You see, I happen to be a baseball player for the Minnesota Twins. Okay? And then the nurse comes in about 20 minutes later and finds the second dad and, and says, sir, congratulations. You are the proud father of triplets. And they're all doing fine. Mom's doing fine. The babies are doing fine. And he's just overcome with joy. And he says, oh, that's just great news. I can't, I can't uh, imagine how blessed I am in this moment. And, and he also said, well, this is just oddly coincidental. You see, I happen to be an executive for the 3M company. And then the third guy, upon hearing that, he falls out of his chair and he's hyperventilating on the floor, and the, the nurse runs over to him and asks him, what is wrong? What's going on? And, and from the floor, as he begins to catch his breath, he says this, I own a Five Guys. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that. So, some, of, some of the choir had to hear that twice today. Um, there is such a blessing of holding, of holding a child, particularly a newborn. And after a while, after a while, if you've noticed, they kind of get it. And they kind of hold you back in their own way because they kind of snuggle in and they get close. They begin to figure it out. I, I mention this today because Pentecost, of course, is the birthday of the church. It's when the church was born. The coming of the Holy Spirit, this rush like a violent wind, these tongues of flame descending and settling on the apostles, giving them the, the ability, giving them the ability to speak in foreign languages that they previously did not know. And I, and I tell the, the little joke there a, a little bit because when you look at Pentecost and when you try to put yourself in the story, you almost feel like that third father, at least I do. It's almost a little overwhelming to imagine what that moment must have felt like and been like, it would have left me and I guess just about anybody a little breathless in that moment with all of that going on, with the Holy Spirit filling the house and filling people, filling the air, and then all of that proclamation happening afterwards. The question that I have for us as, as, we, uh, as we get to this part of the service is, is this, how do we respond to Pentecost? I mean, if we're still a baby that's been born, the church. How do we respond? How do we kind of snuggle in? How do we get closer to God? How do we move together as Christ's body of the church? When you, when you listen to the Word today, when you think about Pentecost, I, it happens in at least three ways because you see in the story, you see in the Scripture, we see from the second chapter of the book of Acts something of the promise of God. We see something of the presence of God, and we certainly see something of the power of God. Where did this come from? How did this day happen? Let's, let's, uh, let's go back just a little bit. Pentecost, of course, it means 50. And Pentecost was and is celebrated uh, as the 50th day after, after, um, after the Passover. Uh, on this Pentecost where the church was born, it was actually 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. So we've been talking about this in recent weeks. Jesus was raised from the dead, and they had to answer that question as we all grappled with in a sermon series about what do we do now? What did they do now? How did they respond to 
the reality that Jesus had rose from the grave, and Jesus had spent 40 days with them, preparing them to carry forth His mission. Last week, we, we talked about the ascension, where Jesus led them out to the Mount of Olives as far as Bethany, and, and that's when He ascended to His Father, and, and it was as if He was saying to them, now it's your turn, your turn to carry on the mission. He gave them the great commission uh, to go into all the nations to teach and uh, to baptize. And he told them, though, but first wait. Wait and, and pray. So for 10 days, they had gone back to Jerusalem. They had gone back to the upper room. There, there they are in the building. There they are. They're waiting and they're praying. And we are told that they are all together in one place. Some translations make it even more clear. They'll say they were all together of one accord in, in, one, in one place. And the, the point is that they weren't just near each other. They weren't just in one room or one house. They, their, their hearts were knit together. Their, their lives were knit together in, in ministry and in sacrifice and in mission over Jesus Christ. They were being made ready to carry on the mission. They were being prepared. And it's in that place, it's in that place of, of preparation, it's in that place of, of unity that the Spirit found them that day. And it was a fulfillment of a promise. Not just the promise that, that Jesus mentioned about the Holy Spirit coming, the Holy Spirit that, that the Father would send. Not just that promise that He mentioned in John 14 of peace that would Sur- be surpassing of, of understanding uh, that, that would be like um, and that, that would be in such a way that they wouldn't feel like they were left as orphans in the world. This is about God's overarching promises to humanity. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis and you find that story in Genesis 11 of the Tower of Babel and that story and that, that word Babel literally means confusion and if you recall that story, it was when humanity was spreading out and was kind of getting a little full of itself and decided that uh, it was going to build a, a tower to reach heaven. And in their pride and in their arrogance, remember what, what God did. God scattered and confused, gave them different languages. Let it not be lost on us that in the very next chapter, Genesis 12, is the call of, of Abram. And then not long after that, there's the covenant with with Abraham and and Sarah that through their offspring, all the families of the world would be blessed, that He would make out of them, God, a, a great nation through whom and from whom He would somehow redeem the world, that He would somehow bring it all back together. And as you look through the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature all the way into the Gospels to the the ministry of Jesus, you begin to see it all coming together, those promises of redemption, those promises of being brought back together, of being given life abundant and life anew and life eternal through Jesus. It's all coming together. There's a fulfillment of a promise, and just as God scattered the people in their, in their arrogance, in their pride, in their hubris, God here at Pentecost to somehow bring it all back together by allowing people to understand the language that they were speaking in. And I'm not just talking about all the different nationalities. It was a language of God's love as well. It was a message that God was bringing humanity back together under the love and lordship of Jesus Christ. It truly, truly was a fulfillment of a promise. We see the promise of God taking place here, but it it also has something to do with the, the presence of God. They they, uh, they experienced something, and it wasn't a private event, of course. As you hear what's happening, as you pay attention to what's happening in the second chapter of Acts, Pentecost, it was a, a spiritual experience, but it was a physical experience. It was an auditory phenomenon. It was a visual experience. People heard it. People saw it. They experienced it undoubtedly at every level of, of their existence, and because it was like a, a rush of a violent wind and it made noise, it, it drew all the people who were, who were gathered there for, for the festival. It drew them to figure out or to, ex, to figure, try to find out what, what in the world is, is going on. And because they had that presence of God, as we heard, they began to, to preach in, in the languages of the people. 
And something had happened. I mean, something happened. I mean, these, these were Galileans, as, as we heard, as we were reminded of. Some people scoffed and said they must be drunk or something. They, they're not even capable of this. These were not learned, educated, scholarly men. These were not the religious officials in Jerusalem. These were those kind of those country guys who'd been hanging out with Jesus for a few years. And here they are doing this. And then there's, you know, Peter, foot in the mouth Peter, who preaches a sermon shortly after, right after uh, the verses where we ended up today. And, and he preaches Christ, risen, crucified and, and risen. And, and um, they're cut to the heart. They, they hear the truth of what he's saying. And they they ask, well, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And, and they heard that message, and they received that message, and they, they turn from, from their selfishness and their sinfulness, and they turn to God. And, well, the church was born that day. Who are these guys? They are guys who have suddenly, in a new way, in a powerful way, the very presence of God. Amazing things happen in the presence of God. We experience peace in the presence of God. We experience empowerment in the presence of God. We experience revelation in the presence of God. We find ourselves in the presence of God in all kinds of ways when we worship, when we pray, when we, when we sing together, when we sing alone in our car maybe, when we serve others in His name. Uh, in countless ways, we, we can experience the presence of God. Years ago, I was on a mission trip in Africa, in Ghana, Africa, and among the, the many things the team did, there was a, an event for families and, and children that we kind of had for about five days running, and, and uh, there was a, a Methodist church in this village, but there really weren't any churches in the outlying areas, and, and we, we got to share um, God's love, the, the news of God's love in Jesus with, with a lot of people who hadn't really heard a lot of it, and and they really responded, and they, they came to be following Christ in that week. And so we start doing baptisms and met with the, the church leadership about what the next steps were with all of these, these new people who were following Christ and how they were to be nurtured in the faith and welcomed in the faith and, and discipled in the faith. And what they eventually came to was a, was a school in that village that is still existing and, and running and blessing people to this, to this very day. But one moment amidst all the conversation and, and planning and visioning that stands out for me is, is when we were praying, and we just experienced the power of God so powerfully. And w what happened was we were about ready to conclude for the day, and, and it seemed appropriate for us to pray, and, and I kind of stood up and I said, well, let's, let's pray. Now, if I'm going to stand up in front of, of us here and I say, let's pray, chances are you're either waiting for me to start praying or me to call on somebody, and then they'll pray. And, but when I, when I said, let's pray in front of my Ghanaian sisters and brothers, when I said, let's pray, they took me at my word. And you know what happened? They all started praying. <laughs> and they were all praying out loud. And uh, they were all praying, of course, in, in Twi, which is the, the, the tribal language in that area of, of Ghana, of which I only understood a, a few words and phrases, although I was learning more as the, my time there went on. And out of that beautiful cacophony of prayers that I could hear, after a few minutes, it began to die down. It began to quiet down. And then all of those prayers unified into one prayer, and I guess to, 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 to bless and, and, uh, and, and, and honor for no reason, but to, out, of, out, of, out of their love for the Americans in the room, they concluded with the Lord's Prayer in English in unison without anybody saying, hey, let's do this. Now, I'm standing here talking to you about this. It says, oh, it sounds like a nice prayer. At that moment, it, it was much more than a nice prayer. It was a moment where we were all in the presence of God. As you think about being a part of this, this baby that has been born, the church, part of how we snuggle in is how we draw near to God in prayer. Through the presence of God and experience that, the Spirit enables that. But there's also a power. The power of God is at full display, is in full display. 
It's in display with how they are, are preaching again in languages that, that they, don't, they didn't know before. It's on display in the way in which people are receiving uh, that Word and how their lives are being transformed. It's on display as you continue in the chapter, this chapter of Acts, when we get just a, a little bit of a glimpse of what the, of what the early uh, life of those early Christians, what it really looked like. And we're, we're told that that uh, they, they moved from house to house, and they, they shared meals with glad and generous hearts. They, they, uh, they shared in such a way, uh, in a day before a lot of social safety nets were in place of hardly any kind, they made sure that nobody in the community had, had any need. That's how generous they were with, with each other. They devoted themselves to the apostles' uh, teaching, and so they were growing in their faith. They were serving and loving each other, and there was something so attractive about that community. There was something so contagious about the way they loved God and the way they loved each other that we're told at the end of the chapter, daily, the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. The power of the Spirit at work, the presence of God, the promise of God. It's all unfolding as the church was born. But you know what? We're still experiencing all of that. We still get to receive and and live into all of that, the promise and the presence and the power of God. And we do it in, in one way, like we're doing today, as we, as we gather for worship. We, we do it as we seek to follow after Jesus Christ. But I had used this image of, of kind of snuggling in like a, like a baby quickly learns how, how to do when a baby is being held. And how do we more fully kind of snuggle into God and snuggle into each other to love God and love each other in such a way that is so beautiful that when people see us, the love of God is undeniable. I, I think it might have something to do with what some of the children around here have been teaching us recently. You might have noticed that we've done a lot of baptisms in recent months. And very recently around here, we had a baptism. Uh, well, they've all been a blessing, quite honestly. And, and maybe you've noticed that our, our, our children, it seems like since the, I don't know if it has anything to do with the before and after the pandemic, if, I don't know if it's sociological, if it's spiritual, I, I don't know, but the children are behaving in ways that I've not seen children behave in baptisms, and I mean that in the best possible way. They're interacting with me in ways I'm not used to. They're, they're interacting with you. Uh, sometimes they'll give me a, a block when I'm getting ready to, or they'll, they'll just look at me and stare intently. Sometimes they'll stare intently with you. Sometimes they'll play with you all, won't they, every now and then. And, uh, but something recently that I've never experienced that really had a, an impact on me, and I picked up a toddler for baptism, and I thought she was going to readily kind of go to me because we were buddies. I mean, when we met, we talked about her shoes, we talked about her dress, we talked about her bow. We, t- we were buddies. We were buddies. But when I had her up here, when I reached down, instead of reaching up, she just kind of opened her arms a little bit like that. And then I went to pick her up. And she did that kid limp body thing. You know what I'm talking about? When a kid doesn't want to go somewhere, she kind of, you know, did that. And, and uh, so I, I, you know, and she's keep doing it. So I'm like trying to gather her up and not like, you know, drop her or anything. And I, and I finally get her up here. And that's, that's when I figured out what she was doing. She just put her head right here on my shoulder. And I don't I have no idea of knowing what was going through her mind in that moment. But, but I think, and it felt like, and it seemed like, she was completely yielding herself to what was happening in that moment. She was yielding herself to God. She was yielding herself to the sacrament of baptism. She was yielding herself to all that God would have for her in that moment. That's what it felt like to me. And, and I was reminded of, of what Jesus said about children, that we need to become like them if we want to inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, on this Pentecost as we rightfully celebrate the birth of the church, let us also seek to become like a child and to fully yield ourselves to all that God has for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
for our invitation to Christian discipleship today. Friends, as almost all of us know, we have an amazing mission of becoming living proof of God's love one person at a time. It really is our way of seeking to fulfill and be faithful to the commission that Jesus gives us all as His followers. As we seek to do that, I, I want to encourage each and every one of you to take your next steps in that mission. And if you're new to Christ Church, I hope you'll consider taking your next step on your faith journey, maybe even becoming a member here. If you would like to talk about that, you can talk to me or anybody here who has a name tag or even the person sitting next to you in your pew. Join us, whether you join the church or not, in this world-changing, life-changing mission.